Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Chapter 5 of Utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill is going to talk about justice and its relationship with the, the key idea running throughout the, the entire treatise, that of utility which has to do with maximizing the positive outcomes and minimizing the negative outcomes for everybody in the community concerned. And the question is whether the notions of justice can map on to those of utility. So Mill says, well, if we want to see whether this is possible, first we have to clarify for ourselves, well, what is justice? And, and conversely, what is injustice? What do people actually mean when they are using these terms? And now notice that we've got five things on the board. That's because Mill talks about five, or perhaps if you want to number them a little bit differently, perhaps six things. The, the, the one that we might say is sixth is actually says a next to, you know, connected with the, the fifth one. Um, and each of these is a somewhat different conception. You notice that there are some similarities, right? Legal rights and, and moral rights, you know, uh, respecting or honoring those. Um, but there's actually some differences here. And there's the possibility of each and every one of these coming into conflict in one way or another with one of these other conceptions when we get down to particular cases. This is why we, we grapple with what we feel to be moral dilemmas. And this is also why we find competing conceptions of justice, you might say, going to war with each other in the body politic or in the court of public opinion. So what are these five notions or five conceptions of justice that Mill says most people tend to have? One is respecting legal rights. Another is respecting a different kind of right, a moral right. And then there's giving people what they deserve, keeping promises or meeting expectations. And then finally, being impartial and maintaining uh, equality of some sort between persons. And he gives us a, a brief discussion of each of these in turn. Uh, allowing us to see what he's actually talking about. So we want to look at, at what he actually says. He says, it's considered unjust to deprive anyone of certain things, his personal liberty, that is his freedom, his property, or any other thing which belongs to him by law. So if, you know, there's a lot of things that, that fall under property, house, you know, a uh, car for, for a lot of us, um, you know, our money, however we happen to have it, you know, money in my wallet as cash or a credit card or something in my bank account. Um, all of those things are, are, are property. Um, there's other things that we might talk about as rights that we have that, that are legally recognized, right to privacy, for example, right? Uh, one that, that took a lot of hashing out uh, over the years, at least here in the United States, with our Supreme Court figuring, well, what, do you get, what exactly counts as, as privacy? A very important issue right now when we think about, well, who owns our data? Who owns our intellectual property? For example, what I'm shooting right here, uh, in a certain sense, belongs to me, but I'm posting it on YouTube, which is where you're watching it, and YouTube is going to use it and make money on it by putting ads and all sorts of things. Even if I disable my ads, they're going to have ads running on the side and all of those sorts of things. Um, well, all of that has to do with legal rights. 
So Mill goes on and he says, um, one instance of the application of terms of just and unjust is a perfectly definite sense. It is just to respect unjust to violate the legal rights of anyone. And of course he says there's, there's going to be exceptions to this, but this is one common conception of justice. You know, uh, you punched me in the face. Well, you violated my legal rights. You called me a terrible name. You might not have violated my legal rights. You said a terrible name and that terrible name was something slanderous or libelous. Okay. Now you violated my legal rights and we can go on and on. The second one is very, very interesting because legal rights for as far as Mill is concerned, don't exhaust the possibilities of right and wrong. This is something that we always have to keep in mind. There can be unjust laws. There can be laws that give a, one person uh, the right legally to do something to another person. Uh, which that person shouldn't have the right to do. In that case, we talk about a moral right. So for example, um, it used to be the case here in the United States, as well as in many other places, that women were not allowed to own property on the one hand, and in many cases were actually treated as if they were property of you know, particular men, uh, Mill, uh, Mill was a, a great uh, opponent of that sort of thing and a proponent of women's equality. Uh, Mill would say that's clearly a violation of a moral right, even if, say, that, that man, husband, father, has a legal right to do so. Another great example here in the United States, it used to be legal for people of one race to own people of another race. And, you know, the Supreme Court actually affirmed that, you know, in, for example, the Dred Scott decision, which later on was overturned as being bad law. But it was for a while the law of the land. And we would say that uh, it was granting a legal right where there was no moral right. So Mill will talk about this in saying that um, legal rights of which a person is deprived may be rights which ought not to have belonged to him in the first place. The law which gives that person the rights may be a bad law. Um, allowing somebody to be a slave of another person, that's a bad law. So Mill says, um, in this case, we, 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 the law is not the ultimate criterion of justice, but may, may give to one person a benefit or impose on another an evil which justice condemns. And then we, we talk not in terms of legal right, but he says moral right. So we say a second case of injustice consists in taking or withholding from any person that to which they have a moral right. That's a very important conception of justice. The third, he says, is very, very basic. This is something that when uh, people are put on the spot and asked, what is justice? And that's a difficult question they often will respond with some variation on this saying, well, it's when you give people what they deserve. And Mill says this doesn't just include giving people nice things, goods. It also includes giving people bad things. So if somebody uh, violates the laws, violates people's rights, maybe they deserve to be punished. In that case, you're imposing something bad upon them. And that is a part of our conception of justice. This can be done, by the way, uh, in, in uh, modes that are not simply retributive, but actually look for some other kind of benefit to accrue from it. The utilitarians were actually big proponents of punishment that would look to the future and have some sort of positive effect for society. They weren't the only ones, by the way. Thomas Hobbes talks about that as well in his Laws of Nature. They were getting a little bit far afield. But in any case, he says, um, it's universally considered just. Each person should obtain that, whether good or evil, which he deserves, and unjust that he should obtain a good or be made to undergo an evil, which he does not deserve. So that's the flip side of it. If I um, deserve to um, 
you know, suffer a, a, a penalty because I don't like to pay my taxes or I like to play my music so loud that everybody in, in my building is stuck listening to it or, you know, pick any other sort of thing that you want. I'm stealing people's packages from the front doors, which does happen uh, quite a bit, as I find out on Facebook <laughs> in certain neighborhood groups. Um, I deserve to suffer something. I don't deserve to get away with it, right? My neighbors don't deserve to have to listen to my music at three in the morning blaring very loudly. Uh, something is out of whack and, and there needs to be some sort of redress. So that, that's another very important uh, understanding of justice. Then we get to a very interesting one, which is also in a different way at the core of justice. And that is keeping faith, keeping promises, uh, meeting certain expectations. Um, Mill will we'll say, says it's confessedly unjust to break faith with anyone, to violate an engagement, either expressed or implied, to disappoint expectations raised by our conduct, at least, and here's the key proviso, if we have raised those expectations knowingly and voluntarily. Great example of this happens in relationships all the time. You know, when we, one person uh, accuses the other in a dating situation of leading them on, right? There are, there are certain things that uh, I suppose could be taken as, you know, sort of express consent. I am going to sleep with you tonight. You say that to another person, They've got a pretty good expectation that unless you're a you know a pathological liar, you're intending to sleep with them. Of course, you know that consent could be revoked or whatever is going on, but there's something there. Wearing something revealing, uh, being flirty, uh, talking to one person instead of talking to another person. In most people's books, most reasonable people's books, that does not count as uh, raising expectations knowingly and voluntarily. You know, um, it, may, it may be viewed as such by the person who then gets upset about it and makes a big stink about it, you know, writes in social media, complains to the person, tries to take matters into their own hands, but they would be unjust in that case. We can only expect of people what it is reasonable to expect of them. But if people do make promises, if I tell you that if you uh, join in this, this contest, you know, there's going to be a prize, somebody better get a prize, right? Because that's, that's an agreement that, that we're making right there. If you hire me to tutor you, and during the tutorial session, I just talk about, you know, my favorite heavy metal bands, unless you were hiring me to talk about the history of heavy metal, um, I'm letting you down. I am committing injustice in a certain respect. And for me to follow through on the agreement that I make, that is another form of justice. Likewise, if I provide you a service, you should pay me for that service if we've agreed upon a price. If you, if you walk up to the front of the store and you put something on the counter um, and it's got a price tag on it, presumably you have agreed to pay that price, unless it's the kind of situation where you get to haggle. The fifth uh, type of justice and injustice that he talks about has to do with partiality. This is very interesting. So Mill says, um, it's by universal, universal admission inconsistent with justice to be partial. What does is, what is being partial mean? It, it means favoring one person over another because of some you know, factor that is not relevant to the case at hand. So a great example of partiality is when we favor those who come from our own group, whether that be, you know, in terms of location, you know, I favor somebody who has the same kind of accent as me or the same color skin or, you know, is a man or is uh, 47 years old at this point in time or pick whatever you like. By the way, it's also a lack of partiality to swing to the other extreme and to say, well, I'm going to make up for past abuses. I'm going to, fa as a man, I'm going to favor women or I will favor uh, young people or old people because I'm middle-aged, right? Or pick whatever you like. That would be partiality as well. 
Another great example of partiality is when we talk about corruption. People pay uh, extra money and they get better services than everybody else. Bribery is, is an example of that, right? This is, raises all sorts of complaints. And Mill says that this is very closely connected with our notion of equality, relevant equality as being a part of justice. This doesn't mean that justice equals equality and not every form of equality is necessarily just. You know, a great example of this, do we pay everybody the same wage? Perhaps there are some jobs that ought to be more remunerative because they are more onerous or they require greater skills or they perhaps even we might say they are in demand. And so the people who can provide them ought to get a premium because of that. And other people who uh, are doing something that anybody can do and is easy to do perhaps don't uh, get quite as much there. There it's not showing impartiality or, in, you know, inequality for its own sake. It's, it's a kind of inequality that could in fact have some sort of rational basis. So he says, nearly allied to this idea of impartiality is that of equality, which often enters as a component part both into the conception of justice and into the practice and in the eyes of many persons constitutes its essence. Now, all of these, notice, could come into conflict with each other in one way or another. We already saw that respecting moral rights really only becomes an issue when the legal system is in some way screwed up. So there's already a connection between those. Giving people what they deserve, could that ever come into conflict, say, with respecting legal rights? It, it depends on how the laws are actually framed. There may be some cases too where um, to enact what is morally right might in fact mean that some people get less or more good or bad than they deserve. What about making promises? Can you make promises that turn out to later on be a bad idea where you say, well, if I fulfill my promise, other people's rights are going to become affected in bad ways, or I won't be able to give people what they genuinely deserve. Should you break the promise then in that case, or should you stick with the promise and say, well, unfortunately, this other part is going to have to give in. Being impartial, treating everybody in, in, in relevant ways equally, uh, can that come into conflict with these? Yes, uh, there are certain legal rights that uh, may often come into conflict with it. There may in fact be some cases where moral rights say that we shouldn't treat everybody equally or where we've made a promise that is going to require that we don't behave in the same way towards, towards everybody precisely because we made a promise. So the question then is how do we reconcile these? And to answer that, Mill is going to make recourse to what he calls utility. 